This is Peter Chihuahua, your humble host for the Weekly Bits podcast. But before we kick off today's episode, I want to remind listeners to check out the Bitcoin 2020 conference. It's slotted for March 27th and 28th in San Francisco, and it's projected to be the biggest ever Bitcoin event. That's not just hyperbole, it's actually anticipating more than 4,000 attendees. Speakers include core devs, possible Satoshi Nick Zabo, skateboarding legend Tony Hawk, and lots of other people. There will be video games, food, and art. You should learn more and consider getting your ticket over at Bitcoin2020Conference.com. And make sure you get them soon. Prices are going to increase on January 31st. All right, so for today's episode, I am joined once again by Colin Harper, Bitcoin reporter extraordinaire and easily the longest hair among the Bitcoin Magazine staff writers. What's up, Colin? What's up, Peter? How you doing, brother? I'm doing well. I'm glad to have you in today because this episode is going to be a little bit different than uh, our others because we're not really talking about Bitcoin directly, although, you know, I'm sure Bitcoin's going to come up at some point. But today I wanted to ask you about your most recent article on the site. It's called The Fed Has Pumped $500 Billion Into the Repo Market. Where Does It End? And if I recall correctly, this article originated with the task, hey, Colin, write a cover story for us. And then this is kind of what you came up with. How did you decide on this subject? And what was that process for you to sort of decide, okay, this is what I want to tackle for Bitcoin Magazine in particular? Yeah, so... When the Federal Reserve started engaging in open money market operations last September, for too long didn't read, for those who don't know what the repo market is, I'm sure we'll get into it later in the podcast, but the repo market is a short-term lending market between banks where to meet liquidity requirements at the end of a business day, banks can take out a momentary, like very short, you know, days to a week long loans from other banks so that they can have enough reserves to pay out obligations at the end of the day. And what the Federal Reserve did in September is they ended up intervening in this market for the first time since the 2007-2008 financial crisis, and they ended up uh, conducting uh, what are known as recurring open market operations. So daily, the Federal Reserve would basically uh, accept bids for repo market operations. They originally said it was going to end in October, but it's still going, and so far they have pumped about 500 uh, billion, like the article title says, into the open uh, money markets. And uh, the reason I wanted to write this article is because it came up, we covered it in September, and it's still going on. And there have been some new developments with how they're uh, debating on who gets the money and uh, they're debating on lending to smaller financial institutions. So it kind of seemed kind of ripe for an update. Right. So this could trickle down to like smaller hedge funds. The thrust being like, this was supposed to be temporary, it's still going on, and if anything, potentially is going to become even like a wider spread practice. Right. So hedge funds and smaller financial institutions can conduct repo agreements with larger banks, but the way these work is they have to use the larger banks as an intermediary. There are a number of regulatory reasons for this, partly because the hedge funds and smaller financial institutions are just smaller by design. So There aren't as many eyes on them, so regulators want to make sure that if these hedge funds are conducting repo agreements, that they're not sketchy, right? They're not like engaging in money laundering and other criminal activities. And so they've always been able to access the repo market through kind of like a secondary market, and and a bank kind of acts as a matchmaker for the liquidity for them, and they have to go through the bank as as an intermediary. But this is the first time ever that the Fed has considered... Um, giving repo agreements directly to smaller financial institutions and hedge funds. This is completely unprecedented. We've seen repo agreements from the Fed, but we've never seen them go this deep into the smaller institutions that uh, kind of underpin the fabric of America's uh, financial institutions and money markets. And this could be a scary thing in, in some regards because hedge funds, even more than banks, are heavily leveraged. Uh, they're always taking out debt to cover obligations and try to expand their assets under management to give their investors a return. So the fear here is that if you're going to start giving these short-term loans directly to hedge funds, these hedge funds are typically more risky in their investments than most larger financial institutions. And it also shows that if the Fed is trying to go directly to the hedge funds, 
then there's a serious liquidity and cash shortage. Like banks are not willing to lend out their cash on right. a short term basis. And so is that the Fed's motivation for pumping the repo market sort of like to increase uh, lending and or just to like generally juice the economy? It's trying to grease the wheels of lending exactly like you said. And the reason why they would do this is because in the repo market, so you know the Federal Reserve sets its target rate for interest rates and those are on loans that last, you know, those those are on your 15 30 year mortgages, right? And and the Federal Reserve controls those with quantitative easing, you know, if there's if interest rates go too high, then they print more bills to get more cash into the system so that interest rates get driven down. And that's what happened in the repo market in September. We saw the overnight lending rate spike from uh, 1.5 to 2% all the way up to 10%. And we think that that was in, in response to JP Morgan not willing to give out cash because they needed to meet uh, reserve requirements. And they, they'd also withdrawn 57% of their cash at Federal Reserve Banks, which is the cash they would have been lending out throughout 2019. So they didn't have as much cash in reserve to lend out. And so you saw the interest rate spike. So what the Fed is trying to do here is, is, is lower the interest rate on those overnight loans. And also, like you were saying, they want to put more cash into the system so that the lending market doesn't just freeze entirely. Because once the lending market freezes entirely, when you're in a system that's over leveraged, if you can't take out more money to pay back obligations on your debt that you already have, then you could kind of see this kind of cascading effect of where you have multiple defaults for multiple financial institutions with each other. And then what you get from that is if that spirals out of control, you get a financial crisis and potentially bank runs. Right. So, and I think the article does a good job of this as well. Our conversation so far, I'm hearing from you, sort of the opening is, this is supposed to be temporary. They're actually expanding it. 500 billion is this huge number. Then, you know, follow up with that with like, we can see where the, why the Fed's motivated to do this. But now I want to end a record that I've set on this episode of the show right now. This is the longest I've ever gone without asking a question with the word Bitcoin in it. Going to officially end that record by asking, you know, I did a control F on the article at one point. The only time I saw Bitcoin come up was because you were providing attribution from a quote uh, to say, you know, told Bitcoin magazine. That's the only time the word's in there. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you kind of to explicitly draw the line for me here between you're wanting to write this article because this practice is unprecedented. The Fed's out of control, to put words in your mouth. Why is that appropriate for Bitcoin Magazine? How does this line up with some of the ideals that, that maybe we have editorially? All right, all right. So I think that like this is one of those kind of peripheral interest stories, I like to call them. Um, like Really staunch and savvy Bitcoiners will always be railing about the Fed in the same way that gold bugs will rail about the Fed, um, and also their intervention into what should be free money markets and free financial markets. The reason why I think this really fits into Bitcoin so well is because this is the system that we're trying to opt out of with Bitcoin, right? Like um, there's no one at Blockstream or working on Bitcoin Core uh, that is ever going to say, hey, let's inflate the supply cap because we need to allocate capital towards, you know, whatever market. Like, oh, there are more shorts than there are longs on BitMEX. Well, let's go give a bunch of Bitcoin to the to the bulls so that they can override the difference, right? Um, right, and just to interject, so like, not only can you not manipulate the uh, reserves of Bitcoin in any way by printing more or anything like that, but you threw out the example of like no one from Blockstream will even say that, but like. Blockstream doesn't even serve as a Fed type entity. Like, right. you know, the best they could do is be one of many voices in the room, too. Right. And that's what I think is so great about, again, the contrast here is like what you have with these open market operations is you have basically the Federal Open Market Committee, um, which is a uh, committee in the Federal Reserve that makes decisions related to uh, interest rates and uh, things like that. And you have the Federal Reserve Board, which is consisted of governors from all the different branches. And you basically have these two entities making decisions that will impact the entire fabric of America's financial system, right? And so it's completely undemocratic. And it's also extremely, again, I want to return back to this idea of like them going straight to the hedge funds. I called my dad up when I said I was going to be writing this article because he just fell down the... Uh, fell down the Austrian rabbit hole following the 2007 financial crisis and was right. trying to make sense of what happened, right? Because everyone at that time was like, what's going on? And you had between, you know, the the um, kind of boilerplate media messages and the kind of party line talk from all the financial journals, you had 
people actually digging into what the subprime mortgage crisis was and how it led to the recession. And when I called him and said, you know, they're thinking about lending straight to hedge funds, his first response was no fucking shit. Yeah. Um, I just think that that really kind of exemplifies where we're at with this kind of, because people still think that the Federal Reserve and that our fiat system is kind of sound. But I mean, we've only been doing this really in full since the 70s when we completely got off the gold standard. And all of this is still, you know, a trial and error. In fact, the Atlanta's f- former Federal Federal Reserve chairman, or the, the, the former chairman of uh, Atlanta's Federal Reserve branch, said that on, on CNBC. It's like, this is trial and error. They're trying to find the right balance. It just seems to me that you're opening up the dangerous opportunity for, you know, not only Wall Street's biggest institutions, but these smaller offices that are heavily over leveraged, getting cheap liquidity from the Fed. Again, going back to the Bitcoin question, this is exactly why we Bitcoin, because right. um, these controls do not exist in the system. <laughs> And I don't think anyone forgets this, but I'll just you know reiterate it anyway. I mean, Bitcoin's born directly out of that, you know, financial the Great Recession, and so any time and uh, this feels so much like connected to that moment in time. That yeah, I think Bitcoiners are really watching this uh, action by the Fed. Yeah, I think so, and that's why I also wanted to write about it is because like they're probably are watching it. You know, like a lot of our readers probably also read Zero Hedge or follow you know. Um, any number of, you know, kind of Austrian or like libertarian leaning uh, kind of financial analyses. Um, But I did want to kind of give our readers a holistic look of like, look, like this is what's going on in the financial markets right now. And like, it doesn't, and Gang Hugh kind of said it, like, no one knows where the balance is here. No one really knows when the Fed's going to stop. He thinks that the latest they'll go is April 15th. But by that time, let's say we have a trillion dollars in repo agreements, (laughs) Right. right? You know, like, and to be sure, like this money is paid back, right? Like when you make a repo agreement, like let's say I'm bank A, you're bank B, I need a hundred million dollars, or let's say in this case, like with the these repo agreements, like I need fifty billion dollars overnight. Like I buy I basically take treasury bonds or mortgage backed securities, other treasuries or other securities, and I post them as collateral uh for this loan. And then uh, you give me the money and then I pay you back in a day or a few weeks. So this money is paid back. But one thing that Gang says in this article, I think is super important to remember. It's like, you know, some of these banks are taking hundreds of billions of dollars in repo agreements. You can't just pay that back in a day or in a few weeks. These are still rolling. Um, And what happens if a bank can't pay it back? Then you really start to see things get bad. I bet you we're going to find out uh, (laughs) what happens. I think so, man. What do you, so tell me more about Gang. How did you find him, and what was it like you know, working with him and, and conducting your interviews? Yeah, so I was doing research for this article, um, and I came across a Wall Street Journal article about the hedge funds maybe entering the, plan, entering the court you know, um, in kind of a more direct manner than they had before. Some reporter at the Wall Street Journal wrote, wrote the article. I just emailed him and said, hey, I'm trying to write something similar. Do you have any sources? Uh, nice guy. I was really uh, willing to offer his help, and then he, he threw me Gang's uh, contact information. Also really, really helpful. Was happy to jump on a call and really kind of walk through these things. Um, And it's really good, I think, to have that kind of perspective, uh, especially someone really involved in this, because he's just, you know, he's on the ground and seeing things that an amateur uh, financial uh, right. critic uh, like myself can't you know <laughs> completely see right shouts to daniel at the wall street journal for that help obviously the main question posed by this article is where does it end you know specifically where is the fed uh, injecting money into what was supposed to be a temporary initiative end and then kind of maybe even more philosophically where does the ends the fed's influence and decisions about uh, like where our economy is juiced and how where does that end so i think the article does a good job by kind of laying out your perspective but asking the reader to obviously draw their own conclusions but i'm going to ask you kind of personally what your uh take on the answer to that question is i think the federal reserve's interventions in american money markets and financial markets and have like read up on what other people have said that the, you know, like the effects of this is. But for me, this felt like a much bigger thing than perhaps the mainstream, maybe not the mainstream media, but just it seemed like such a big thing that so many people are oblivious to that it couldn't help 
I couldn't help but recall kind of stories of the beginning of the collapse from 2007, like after reading Michael Lewis's Big Short. Yeah, where you're like, oh my gosh, they knew they didn't have the money to borrow to yeah. pay for this house, and they're just getting this big house anyway. Yeah. And I I mean, I don't want to, maybe that's where, not where you were going, but but I would think like not blaming the average consumer, but like, because I can see why you are either because it's so opaque it's so confusing yeah. it seems like it's a good idea money lenders are probably telling you it's a great right. idea and then in retrospect obviously you know a lot of homeowners for instance made really dumb right. decisions uh, right and the banks made it easy for them to make those dumb decisions right. and i think in like retrospect that's the right word because after the fact it looked like the writing was on the wall for the financial crisis but no one could read it right and like right now, I feel like there's a message on the wall. Everyone's reading it, but I don't know. We're still trying to figure out like, is this as serious as it could be? And I think the question is, is it as serious as it could be? It's totally contingent on when the easy money stops. And so for me, you know, I think that's really is the big question. Like no one knows when this is going to end. And I think for me, what it really represents, I don't think it's going to end well. I think you're very well seeing like, kind of the early shakings of the financial markets as they are in the U.S. right now. Like, even as, like, I just think it's totally, like, there's cognitive dissonance, right? Like, at the same moment when the Dow and the NASDAQ and the S&P are hitting these crazy new all-time highs, I mean, Apple gained 100% of its market share last year at 2 x um, its, its uh, stock price. At the same time, America's biggest financial institutions are saying we don't have enough cash on hand to grease lending markets. Yeah. And for me, it just almost seems like the Fed has to keep exercising a greater degree of control over these markets for them to run as intentioned. So it's like, you know, the puppet's arm keeps falling off. But the Fed keeps running on mid-show, patching it up, attaching a new string to it, hoping they can still animate it, right? Right. And the puppets are simultaneously getting patched up in the middle of work, of being operated on. You know, they're, The Fed is pulling the strings and patching them at the same time. And they're still dancing around on the stage, but you're starting to see pieces of the puppets fall off. Right. But we're being told, oh, no, this is fine. We're going to fix this. Just one more patch up and then we're done. And we do have this recent, like, pretty recent firsthand experience watching a puppet, like, yes. implode and flame. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like spontaneously combust yeah. on stage. And then we're being told right. it's not like this time. But, you know, every time, you know, when recessions come and go and always for different reasons, right? Like, you know, in 2007, it was the, the mortgage backed uh, securities subprime mortgage crisis. Um, the next one, who knows what is going to be the time bomb in Wall Street that's that's ticking away. Yeah. But one thing that I've learned from all of this research and from reading up on things like 2007 is just that Wall Street will create any derivative and any product it can. And, mo- and like all of these derivatives are based off of debt. And the derivatives they're based off of are based off of other derivatives that are based off of debt. So for me, it's just like you have this juggling act. And I don't know how many balls you can keep in the air before they all fall down. Yeah, and I think we've touched on this, but Bitcoin, you know, is not directly in this equation, but it would have all of this sort of does have implications for for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the perfect alternative and hedge to this. Right. Um, In my opinion, of course. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, One thing I'd highlight that we didn't touch on is I like the art a lot for this story. So if you have listened this far into the podcast and somehow not, gone to bitcoinmagazine.com to check it out. Definitely go ahead and do that. Uh, Colin, is there anything else from you that we didn't talk about you'd want to highlight on this? Um, the last thing I would say is whenever anyone tries to tell you that Bitcoin is worthless or that it shouldn't be able to justify a $160 billion market cap, which is about what it's at right now, uh, the Federal Reserve did $160 billion in repos in one week. and to me, that's just like, whenever I have doubts about what we're doing here, that's super comforting for me to know that the amount of money that has been trusted in the Bitcoin ecosystem for the past 11 years still does not supersede what the Federal Reserve can do in a single week. And that's super bullish to me. 
Yeah, if you ask what is Bitcoin's value, like it's just magical internet money that doesn't do anything. Uh, one of many th- answers to that question is, you know, it's a hedge against uh, financial systems run mm-hmm. by trusted third parties. Yeah, and reckless monetary policy. <laughs> yeah. All right, awesome. Uh, thanks again for being my guest today, Colin. Great work on that article. Uh, please insert personal Twitter plug here. Uh, you can find me at As I Lay Hodling. My name also Colin with one L Harper. I'm on Twitter there. You can find me at Bitcoin Magazine. I'm around. Uh, listeners can find my author page on Bitcoin Magazine and follow me on Twitter at Peter Chihuahua. That does it for another episode of Bitcoin Magazine's Weekly Bits podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll be back next week. In the meantime, please don't forget to leave us a rating and review so we can improve the show and help reach undoctrinated no-coiners. The Bitcoin Magazine Weekly Bits podcast is a BTC Media produced podcast on the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. Thanks again to my guest, Colin Harper. This episode was produced and edited by Graham Peterson and David Holleran. If you're interested in reading the story we discussed or others like it, check out our homepage at BitcoinMagazine.com and make sure to follow us on Twitter at Bitcoin Magazine to keep up with all the latest. You can find more engaging podcasts over at Let'sTalkBitcoin.com and you can follow them on Twitter at the LTB Network for all the latest episodes. Be sure to subscribe to the show on the Apple Podcast app, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.